Hello everyone, it's me, the Boss Hog, and today, as well as looking through our list of companies that we cover in a bit more detail, I'd like to do a deep dive on Huntington Bank. It's one of my holdings. I'd like to tell you why I enjoyed their quarter four earnings and what I expect from them moving forward. Let's do it. All right, so in terms of my notable company updates, actually quite a few of them didn't have any news this week. So uh, Gamma, Games Workshop, Evraz, Medical Properties, Kanos, Hollywood Bowl, and Polymetal. To be clear, MPW continues to be well written about, but I continue to think that nothing new is being added. If you're a bear before, you're a bear still. If you're a bull before, you're a bull still. So I don't really see there's too much value in me highlighting that. If anyone's interested, just look at a bunch of articles on Google, right? Uh, so in terms of the ones that I am covering, we're going to dedicate a lot of time in this video to Huntington Bank shares. So uh, I'm just going to refer to them as Huntington or Huntington Bank. Everyone else does, including themselves. So we're going to cover their earnings update in detail. In terms of other updates, uh, let's start with Phoenix. So there have been multiple analyst upgrades this week, uh, mostly small tweaks, to be honest. I would say that consensus now sits at about 730. That, that is where it sits, 731 to be exact. This is fractionally above my 720 own target. I'm sort of happy with people's understanding of Phoenix, which is, I think, improving over time. I've noticed that a lot of the analyst targets have kind of um, narrowed. So beforehand, it was like five pounds to nine pounds 50. Now, you know, it's much more like the sort of 570 is the most bearish up to kind of like 780, eight pounds, that kind of level. So it's definitely narrowed quite a lot, a lot of the, in, in both directions, to be clear, as I think sort of people get their heads around the business, which is changing from a life assurance, closed booked, uh, very niche um, and small margin kind of business that had achieved scale, but was ultimately in a kind of time limited uh, horizon to more of a kind of wealth manager, pension provider, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I think their purchase of Standard Life is transformational and they've been acquiring since. And by the way, they, they have a lot of cash on their books. I'd really like to see them buy some more um, and go from there. So that, that's an exciting stock, actually, despite the fact it's seemingly quite boring uh, to start with. Next up, we've got Amcor. I just want to highlight this. This is my biggest stock. It has been on a run recently, although it had a pullback last week. I would say that there is further optimism building around this stock. Um, the main arguments here were similar to mine, which is that basically, um, well, the the um, the kind of exposure that Amcor has in the semiconductor space should mean it's less cyclical and less exposed than companies like Micron, as an example, which obviously had really brutal um, earnings, uh, which kind of was expected. Anyone, I think, who's sort of semi-familiar with the semi-super uh, cycle kind of knows about it. But they also highlighted China opening and suggested that basically it could benefit from a moderate multiple upgrade. Uh, so I have I have still like a 36 target here in terms of my dollar. So uh, it, they're still slightly below me. Um, but I, I would say that that's sort of broadly in a line if, if you do take the argument that it deserves a slightly higher uh, multiple. Um, broadly speaking, though, yeah, it was in line with what I was expecting and it was um, a reasonable article. So, again, feel free to, to read that in your own time. Uh, Genius had another sports agreement here with uh, Sports Network. Um, it kind of divides it into two, and I think it's worth separating this out just to make people a bit more familiar with Genius because they basically have three different revenue streams and two of them here are impacted. So first of all, uh, they did a deal specifically for the NFL um, where they have both augmented overlays, which is really cool. Uh, again, go and check this stuff out. It's really nifty. If you're into sort of betting or sort of really are a sports advocate, then it kind of allows you to monitor things that you wouldn't normally see pop up, right? So which players have run where, uh, stats about their performance, stats around plays. It's, it's really kind of brings you closer to the action. Um, I first came across like augmented reality about eight years ago, interestingly enough, when I was looking at invoices and kind of doing an overlay into the information we were sending out to customers. It blew my mind. I kind of finally saw that opportunity there to bring augmented reality there. It was still very early in those days, and I feel like Genius is ahead of the curve with this uh, technology. So um, the deal basically covers the augmented overlay into the NFL specifically, as well as giving TSN um, access to uh, like a portfolio of data across many leagues as well. So which is one of their sort of big data offerings, right? So that you've got like the, the streaming and the uh, content offering, as well as the, the data specifically for everybody outside of the NFL. So for me, this is just more good news basically for Genius. It's using its um, propositions to, to leverage itself further and basically sign more deals. I thought it was a good article here for, um, from Zach Swidley, which is often a bit crap because like automatic and algorithmic. Uh, but this one actually must have had a human behind it or it's the best uh, AI written article I've ever seen. Um, I think that it was a very well balanced 
um, article, they go, they do settle on a $32 price target, which is below even my low end. And I have an extremely wide range at the moment, um, Huntsman, because there's so much changing about it that I need like more. I don't feel comfortable giving a single number, basically. But my lowest range is 34. So they're still slightly uh, less bullish than I am on this. Um, but yeah, they, they laid out the benefits here, which I basically agree with. Um, over the last many years, really, Huntsman has kind of turned itself from a kind of quality sorry into equality instead of quantity so if you actually look at them like they'll, they'll typically get picked out of a lot of screeners because their revenue has been decreasing but what they've become is a more nimble business basically with with higher margin focus on more downstream parts of the production cycle strategic acquisitions is kind of um, a bolt on to that point synergies likewise uh, likewise they're also upgrading a uh, a splitter which is like a, a chemical process for deriving different um things out of it uh for anyone who's not a chemist that's my layman's interpretation of it and likewise further cost initiatives in how they um how they manage and uh, focus on their output so again this splitter allows them to produce multiple different outputs they're basically smart enough to try and target uh, opportunities in terms of supply and demand, et cetera, is kind of nifty the way it works. Um, I also think it's very valid in its bear cases here is, is headwinds. It doesn't really take a bear position, but its headwinds is more accurate. So input costs, logistics and supply chain pressures. Again, this was all exactly what Huntsman called out themselves. Uh, and as well as Huntsman called out the fact that, you know, Europe is a cause for concern, both with the higher input costs, as well as an unfavorable regulatory and environmental pressures as well. The article doesn't go as in-depth in those, as you will hear on the earnings call. Huntsman themselves are very negative about Europe and its kind of uh, operational situation and kind of the outlook of the chemical industry and more generally. Um, so, yeah, so they, they were quite um, harsh and they continue to be quite harsh on Europe as an operational environment. Um, so yeah, overall, I, I think it was a good, well-balanced article for anyone who's interested in reading. The only thing I would um, uh, criticize it for is there was literally no mention of the fact that uh, Huntsman are disposing of their textile division. This was their lowest margin uh, and smallest division. It leaves them with three main divisions now instead of four. Um, for me, it'll be interesting how they kind of pivot. So I'm expecting, again, revenue to actually decrease, but margins and earnings uh, per share, that, that kind of stuff to actually increase. Um, and again, it'll be interesting to see what, what the exact commercials look like and so on. So uh, for me, that's part of the uncertainty around Huntsman at the moment. And last but not least, before we get into HBAN, is Fever Tree. So just a small update here. So I, I suspect some UK viewers will be familiar with Finsbury Growth and Income Trust. It's kind of one of those um, funds that people may have heard of. It kind of is a smaller cap focused growth, um, as it sounds, uh, trust. And they had a notable position in Fever Tree, which uh, Nick Train, who's the manager of that fund, described as his biggest disappointment last year. Interestingly, though, like although he describes himself as feeling clever when he was buying and then not so clever when he realized how low it goes. I felt like everyone has experienced that knife catching feeling. Um, he remains still very bullish on the on the company themselves. He he wasn't as critical as I think he could have been in terms of the failure to execute strategy, uh, which I think there is some legitimate concern that at least I have around Fever Tree. And, and again, hopefully this new um, share of the non-execs they bought in from S&B uh, Miller will uh, improve the situation there. But again, he was extremely bullish about the branding, which again, I think is really solid. And he highlights the fact that like, let's just uh, yeah, the US expansion is exciting and all the rest of it, especially now the logistics there have hopefully been sorted. But actually, the global expansion offers some significant opportunities outside of the US as well, which I think is fair. Uh, so that was uh, an interesting um, article from a fund manager who was sort of critical of maybe the, how quickly they bought their position, uh, but remained uh, confident, you know, wasn't panicking to sell or anything along those lines and is optimistic on their rebound, which I kind of share as well. But again, I think maybe he could have been slightly more critical about some of the execution errors as I see them over the last 12 months. Um, maybe that's how he feels internally, but he doesn't want to admit it, right? Um, anyway, uh, like I say, a bunch of my um, companies I choose to give more detail on didn't have any updates this week. And now I'd like to spend a bit of time walking through Huntington Bank shares. All right, so the way we're going to do this, we're going to do an opening here and then a conclusion. And then I'm going to pull out sort of um, about seven different slides that they presented in their deck th uh, that accompanied the earnings update. The deck was about 45 odd pages. It's quite detailed, I would say, Huntington Bank shares. They have a lot of uh, income streams and divisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these, in my opinion, are the most important things to call out. Uh, obviously, the, the data is all available on their investor relations page. So that's going to be the approach. Let's do it. Uh, I would describe the update of the Q4 earnings as broadly positive. Certainly year on year saw significant growth, although that is um, related to acquisitions. 
to me, it showed continued good execution on their strategies. We'll touch more on that shortly. But um, there were two areas for me of what I would class as modest concern. One of them on the more minor side of modest and one of them on the more mediums to large side of modest. So again, we'll get to those uh, shortly. Um, I would, uh, just to give you a bit of background information on HBAN, they're now a middle constituent, almost back bang in the middle of the S&P 500. They have a market cap of 20 billion. Uh, I would describe it as kind of um, very broad. I mean, like regional banks get a lot of like sl uh, slack for the fact that they are, well, regional. So they, they don't have the kind of broad exposure that, you know, Bank of America or JP Morgan might give you. Um, and it is important when you look at a regional bank to consider the region that they operate. But HBAN has done a good job of making itself less regional, i.e. More, more national, right, as it expands into more states. That's partly been through acquisitions. Um, as well as sort of growing organically. So for me, uh, that's that's a good thing, I suppose, that you're kind of getting the benefit of a regional growth company. Again, it's not exactly a Mickey Mouse small company, 20 billion and in the middle of the S&P 500 is big. And this would put it into like the top sort of 20% uh, of the FTSE 100. It, it's a big company by most standards, just by American standards, it's kind of middle. Um, so uh, cool. And uh, the divisions here are commercial, consumer, business, auto finance, and auto finance is kind of grouped into sort of marine finance, RVs, etc. So basically anything that you can drive is auto and private clients. So I think most of these are quite self-explanatory. Consumer and business, I think, is clear. Auto finance is there. Private clients, so high net worth, etc. This is an area of growth for them as well as sort of cross-selling. Uh, and then commercial is sort of... Um, you know, like capital raising, mergers and acquisition advice, book building, that kind of stuff. So it's so quite specific. And again, to them, that's a high um, growth opportunity area. So aided by acquisitions, uh, 2022 was a record breaking year for them, as we'll see. All four quarters uh, recorded are uh, highs um, and that's measured specifically against pre-provision net revenue. Uh, in terms of what that is, that kind of measures the income from um, interest rate income, non-interest rate income, and then non-interest expenses. So it's basically a Federal Reserve measure. To UK viewers, I suspect this won't be a super common thing, um, but I think anyone covering US financials uh, will be familiar with this term. I, I did do a little bit of reading on it. It's basically a kind of measure that the Fed likes that takes into account both the economic situation as well as the situation in the bank and is seen as one of their key measures for things like stress tests and things like that about their performance. It's certainly the measure that HBAN choose to talk about the most. It's uh, the, once you get past the introductions, it's the first sort of hard data that you come across and it's it's the main measure that they, they measure themselves on. Uh, some things to call out just very quickly is loan growth up 10%, deposit base up 3%, uh, return on capital here um, up as well. You'll see that that's one of the most impressive measures to me. We'll see the graph and how it's going up like that. It's really impressive that they've been able to integrate some of their acquisitions. I would say their balance sheet is solid. They have cash available for organic growth, dividends and buybacks. So actually, I just want to talk about the end of that sentence there, because when I've reviewed these before, they had four targets and it was acquisitions, organic growth, dividends and buybacks that were in that order as well. And basically acquisitions or inorganic growth has been removed entirely. And it was interesting that one of the analysts remarked on that point, right? Like, have you basically like, are you happy with your size now? Have you given up on acquisitions? And the board were basically like, it's just not a focus for us, right? Obviously, if there's an opportunity and we do have a, um, you know, a, a list of companies that we keep an eye on, et cetera, et cetera, then we would have a look at it. But it's certainly not, they, they feel now like basically that they've reached the scale and they have the expertise um, that they don't need acquisition. So I thought that was an interesting change. And uh, as we'll get to in a second, there is uh, more focus now on buybacks and because they have increased their share count over the last few years to help fund this acquisition. So I think that's worth highlighting and we will highlight it in a couple of minutes as well. Uh, last but not least, EPS was fractionally ahead of expectations. Um, HBAN have had a re reputation, I suppose, over the last sort of two years of beating um, expectations, not by much, just sort of like a few percent each time, sort of between like three and eight percent. Uh, but consistently running slightly ahead of what people were expecting from the bank, which again, to me is pleasing. Um, and it kind of might indicate that analysts haven't quite caught up yet with the, the potential. Although as we'll see later, I, I still personally think I'm ahead of most analyst expectation, but there is a very broad range of analyst um, target prices here. So that's the overall summary as I would recognize it. Uh, we're gonna dive into the detail now. All right, so I'm actually gonna start with a dividend. Um, that's mainly because some people would consider um, HBAN a dividend focused stock with some justification for sure. 
so first of all, I'm going to talk about buybacks. Um, HMAN have been doing buybacks in the past as well as uh, printing more shares. So it's a bit of a nuanced picture, I would say. However, their latest announcement was quite material. So they're planning a buyback of a billion dollars over the next two years, which is around 5% of the market cap. In terms of how a billion dollars looks at their current earnings, that's about five months worth of earnings. So you could potentially think of it like that, that it's about 20 to 25 percent of their earnings across the next two years are going to fund buybacks. For me, I think that's quite sensible. Um, I, I kind of like the idea of a company sort of taking a 50 percent payout ratio of their earnings and sort of dividing it into uh, share repurchases and dividends, uh, because ultimately, as a long term investor, as I hope to be with HBAN, um, I want to become a bigger owner over time. So that's very appealing. And also as a UK investor, I don't have to worry about the 15% withholding tax I have to pay on American dividends via buybacks. So that to me as well is an efficiency uh, that I like, uh, basically is, is preferred for me. Uh, and again, so really like looking at this, you're looking at, you know, between 20 and 25% of their earnings over the next two years, assuming no growth in earnings, by the way, which is something else. Uh, but you can also see here that they had a, a significant couple of years where they've increased their share count. Again, I'm not expecting any large acquisitions. Certainly the, the, the couple of recent ones have been quite transformative and did significantly increase their scale. Um, dividend was unchanged this quarter. I would say that was slightly disappointing, to be honest, that like, this will be like, the fifth quarter that, um, that the dividend has been the same. I was expecting a modest increase, to be honest, something like 1575, even like if I look at certain websites, they've almost assumed that, by the way, because of how they were growing. To me, this indicates that they're kind of happy with their dividend yield already and actually would view their own share prices um, not where they would want it to be. Um, the dividend yield is 4.3%, which does run ahead of sector peers. Sector peers here are basically other regional banks, how they compare themselves. Um, so yeah, so they've taken the decision basically to not increase their dividends. They certainly could, They're, they definitely have the money, uh, but this was a decision they chose to, to exercise and fair enough, I suppose. Um, so you can kind of see the dividend growth there. I, I like it when the graphs do this. I do wish that um, the data from the board would also indicate, you know, um, when they increase share counts, right, which of course they never do because it's always glossed up and you can see sort of that's why I think it's important to always look at share counts when you're, uh, especially when you're buying sort of growth companies, as as I would argue that HBAN still is, it hasn't quite reached maturity yet, although I think it is close um, to that and following the couple of years of the acquisitions they've had. I, I think it is kind of starting to turn from a growth company into sort of more of a, a solid company. It definitely has some opportunities though to sort of cross sell and be synergistic with some of its more acquisitions, more recent acquisitions. Um, so that's why some people refer to HBAN as a dividend paying stock, which of course it is. I mean, compare this to the S&P and it's well over double. Um, but I think still it, it needs to kind of um, now start buying back shares again. And, and I think um, these kind of return to shareholders, you need to bear in mind the graph on the right as well, which has given you, by the way, a much better and well-rounded and larger bank. So I'm, I'm happy with this. But now I hope that over time we will see this uh, decrease. So, yeah, decent dividend, though, and a clear direction of travel in terms of the buyback moving forward. OK, so here is PPNR. And honestly, I, I spent far too much time wondering which I should display first, PPNR or dividends. Uh, so, yeah, as I kind of already led with here, it, it is the most important measure to HBAN. It is what they choose to call out, first of all. You can definitely see the direction of travel here is super positive. Um, I would also point out that the notable one offs, which they've highlighted with the kind of greyish, bluish um, offset, um, that's now largely washed through, right? So all of the benefits have um, landed effectively, but what you're currently seeing is the return on, I mean, ROC is sort of what you're more commonly used to working with, right? For banking, specifically HBAN, don't always see this uh, in other banks, but return on tangible capital equity is uh, moving in the right direction, right? I can see that they're, they're obviously here, they have the COVID impact of 2020, but broadly speaking now, uh, we continue to to progress, right? And I think the efficiency measure here going to sort of uh, 20.7, or again, once you exclude the one-offs, which we shouldn't have so many in moving forward, uh, really positive 18.2% uh, for the year. And likewise in Q4, they're, they're really starting to hit their stride, I would say, toward the end. Like I'm, I'm very much looking forward to Q1, where I'm optimistic that we'll continue to see a kind of, um, a fairly rapid, I hope actually, uh, increase in some of this stuff. Like you can really see the big jump there. And there's a lot of sort of underlying positive directions of travel, uh, despite the kind of fairly challenging uh, macroeconomic backdrop 
that they find themselves in. So again, here, th this was positive for me. They're running slightly ahead of their own expectations. There, there is actually a detailed um, breakdown of their acquisitions in their earnings report where they kind of highlight, um, you know, how much they've saved, how much they're running ahead. And a lot of them are kind of, you know, one to two quarters ahead. So uh, again, I think that's pleasing that they're kind of realizing these opportunities of, of these acquisitions slightly sooner. It basically just means it was a better business case uh, than they originally had when they bought it, right? So yeah, so th this is positive to me. I don't want to spend too much time on it. It's it's because, uh, sorry, not to gloss over it, but because of the fact that because of how PPNR is made up, we're basically going to now go into the detail of the three components and you'll, you'll get the details behind these numbers. All right, so some good stuff here. Um, this, by the way, groups all of their segments, but primarily this is driven by consumer and business banking. Uh, so average loan and lease balances up 8.6% uh, year on year. And if you exclude uh, payment protection plans, PPP, uh, you're looking at 10.4%. I can never quite decide which one I want to call out. They call out both, I would say, with equal importance. It's just a different, um, the the asset, or sorry, the income from the liability, to be exact, is, is just treated differently for the PPP component of the loan. Basically, there's different implications for how you, you manage that internally within a bank. Uh, so that's uh, fine. Um, the other thing to point out here as well is like the the yield effectively has been increasing. You'll see very shortly that the HBAN took a decision with some of their lending to actually reduce the amount of lending and focus a bit more on the quality. Uh, certainly reading between the lines of what was said and what's in this report, um, there are some concerns about the economic situation within their region. I, I think that's very clear. And they've sort of been moving themselves to stop dealing with anyone who doesn't have at least prime. So basically a normal kind of customer or super prime, which is basically, you know, less likely to default that they have a clear focus on not dealing with um, more high risk customers, should we say, even though, of course, there's more, always more reward upside potential with that. This is more of a conservatively run bank. When you certainly look at the asset allocation as well, um, they have some hedging, they have some collars that they're, they're very mindful of the fact of um, what the future might hold so that they are more hedged potentially than you might expect. For me, it's absolutely fine that they are taking a risk adverse approach. I don't I don't always need sort of uh, stellar growth from a company that's already 20 billion, even though, again, you could realistically claim this is a growth opportunity. In terms of where the, the focus from the lending increased the most, it was uh, focused in commercial plus 10.6%, but consumer still saw solid growth with 6.2%. Uh, and they called out specifically mortgage and auto marine. Um, I would say that, yeah, the, the automotive um, side of the business, like for anyone who's kind of bullish on auto insurance, I think you should really have a look at H-Band. They run well ahead of their peers. They have a surprisingly good um, business model, as far as I can tell, with uh, auto loans specifically. Um, it's quite large as well, and they, they seemingly don't have any issues or concerns with it. Run, you know, the, the delinquencies, as they call them, are far below peers and averages. They believe that they have sort of proprietary technology and, and algorithms, presumably, that allow them to be very smart in terms of who they're lending to. And certainly the outcome would support that they must be doing something different. So if you are unusually bullish, um, definitely worth looking into. And actually it was interesting. There was a lady um, on the call, an analyst, and she was new to HBAN. She, she called herself out and she was like, for me, like, just give me a kind of understanding here of why you're so good on auto loans. Um, because, you know, I was on an earnings call earlier today and it was dreadful for like an insurer dealing with this, right? That was more or less her wording. Um, and I found that very telling because, you know, certainly my understanding of insurance and auto loans in the US is it's a bit messy at the moment. And, and certainly when I look at UK focused insurance companies, I'm not really interested in anyone with a high exposure to, to auto car insurance, basically. Um, so it's, it's very interesting that even the analysts were surprised at these numbers. So I just might be of interest to you. For me, again, I wouldn't usually want a business. Uh, with high exposure to auto loans, but when you're making it work, then brilliant, right? It's just another revenue and earning stream for you. So that was uh, very interesting for me. Uh, deposits also moved in a positive direction, um, albeit with interest rates increasing. So again, because a, a lot of people just assume with some understanding that interest rate increases from a central bank is all good news for a bank. And of course, overall it is right there. Um, HBAN's non 
um, sorry, their interest income is, of course, very good at the moment, as most banks are. But it does also mean as well that you basically have to pay more money to hold those deposits. So there is an element here of an increase in cost as well. Uh, so it, it's just something that a bank has to manage as part of their, um, you know, the, the kind of most traditional way that banks make money, right? The difference on that spread. Uh, so there was definitely an increase, as you can really see it here in Q4. Um, but again, this is all moving in a positive direction for me. I did think it was quite telling that the increase was almost entirely commercially driven. Only a tiny percentage of this is um, consumer. And the bank, uh, as in HBank, called this out and said that, you know, it's just because uh, consumers are eating through their savings, which I thought was a very interesting sort of one liner. I was kind of surprised that analysts didn't call them out. And also that there were, you know, like there was less remortgaging and, and HBank themselves were being more disciplined on their remortgaging. Um, so yeah, just less money was being uh, left with them as part of sort of any any attempt to get a mortgage, right? Uh, so I thought that was that was kind of telling. But yeah, the, the first part of those call outs was um, somewhat concerning to me. Um, but again, I suspect that a lot of banks are seeing this as well. It was just, yeah, for me, I would have liked one of the analysts to ask the question just so we could get an understanding of if there was a concern there. To be fair to the analysts and to HBAN, there were lots of conversations, um, questions and answers about the kind of their expectations that HBAN are potentially more bullish than other companies about the state of the economy and so on. So th there was that, but I would have just liked them to have called out that specific line. Uh, whether they see any concern moving forward but again overall because you get such a well-rounded business now um you know one part of the business isn't performing as strongly typically another part picks it up so again this is broadly moving in a positive direction um and you'll see in a second as well when we get to delinquencies that they are really good at um collecting this kind of money so you can kind of bank on a lot of this uh being collected rather than falling into bad debt again assuming that the economy doesn't deteriorate uh, very materially all right. So speaking of net interest income, you can see here, I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, plus 29% uh, year on year. Um, I mean, really good. Uh, the margin here as well. So again, the spread is pretty solid, I would say, for, for a bank. Uh, definitely moving in the right direction here in terms of the bottom graph. You can see it kind of going from uh, 2.85 to 3.52. Uh, I don't really like the spread here is so close between adjusted and non-adjusted. I'm just going to stick with the same measure for both. Um, so, yeah, re really positive. Uh, I haven't actually got a ton of stuff to add, but I, I just thought because we're talking about the breakdown of PPRP uh, that we needed to talk about net interest income. Uh, so, yeah, for me, uh, good good direction, um, improving margin and uh, average loans. So the only thing I would add here is I kind of wish that um, HBAN would start splitting out the divisions, at least between business and consumer. Uh, that would be good for me to see. Um, but at, at the moment, they don't split it out. So I have no split to offer. Um, yeah, and, and, and how it's divided. I, I do appreciate with the interest income, it's probably a lot more group. Uh, but again, I, I would expect that they are able to trace that back into, into the divisions, um, I would presume anyway. Uh, but they, they don't certainly share that if they do have that split internally. So, but yeah, th this is positive. I almost don't want to dwell on it because even though it is positive, it's exactly what I would expect from a company which has acquired other companies in a environment where the interest rate is increasing. And, you know, where, again, they're, they're quite disciplined on managing that spread. Um, for me, though, the most important part here is the bit at the bottom, which is definitely showing an improvement in the margin specifically. Right. Um, so scale is one thing. But basically, if you have scale and an improvement in margin, that's a, then a multiplicative uh, moving forward. But other than that, not too much to share here, other than the fact it's looking good to me. All right. So I might attempt to offer some balance and honestly, some uh, Honesty, as I see it. Anyway, my interpretation here is the next couple of points are going to be a bit negative. So we're going to start on this, which is the most disappointing part to me, which is their non-interest income. Now, I do understand that the business has been growing, but a lot of the growth areas that they've really been targeting are around non-interest income. Right? Ignore the scale for the moment. Like a lot of their bolt-on acquisitions, not the truly transformative bigger scale ones, have been targeted on commercial lending and business banking and private wealth management. And I'm kind of expecting that those things are going to become, again, synergistic and there's going to be a lot of overlap here. Um, but actually, I uh, didn't really see it. And, and actually, year on year here, you're looking at sort of a 3% reduction uh, in non-interest income. Now, again, this was explained. Uh, they do take a couple of slides to really walk through it, as well as um, on the earnings call. Uh, so the two main call outs here, I would say, was that there was a pause in business lending, small business lending specifically. I uh, thought that was interesting, um, as well as the fact that they are more targeting um, customers, customer discretion and sort of um, credit risk management um, for both consumer and business this time now. Uh, so both of those points are ultimately an attempt to manage risk, right? They, they are just being more picky than they originally expected in terms of who they're allowing <clears throat> uh, into some of these products. 
again, if, if we focused on the category here, there is some positives, I would say. So uh, the capital markets for me is something I was looking at because, again, the acquisition should be very supportive of that. And you can see a huge improvement with that over time. So that's pretty good. But everything else is kind of either flat or other. Um, so that, that to me was um, disappointing. The, the um, non-interest income kind of waterfall here on the bottom left um, gives you some idea of, of how that's looking. So yeah, the middle banking income is significantly down, which to me was really disappointing. Um, and yeah, I would I definitely that size of that drop. Now there were one-offs and exceptional, so maybe some slightly tough comparables. Uh, but for me, again, I, I would sort of expect this to be looking better than it did. So it's good that we have the capital markets uh, improvement there, but there's a lot of stuff that I would expect to be doing better uh, than it has been. So from that perspective, uh, yeah, I don't really know how to say it. I was just disappointed. I, I'm sort of expecting clearer understanding of whether this is more of a problem or where it's just a one off against tough comparables moving forward. Um, for me, again, I, I will be very curious come Q1 and, and onward um, how this starts to, to look, because certainly the non-interesting company is an area of significant growth opportunity for HBAN. Certainly some of their acquisitions are on the premise that they'll be able to not just go into these markets, but also cross sell, right? You're starting to deal with like rich people, rich businesses. So then you've got the, pri the private client division as well, which they recently significantly improved with an acquisition. And then you've got the kind of business banking as well. So there, there's kind of in theory, this whole journey where you take people on through this and you, you kind of cross sell into them as individuals and them as, um, you know, as owners of businesses and, and such like. So uh, for me, this was the main weakness, I would say. We'll touch on the second one in just a moment. Um, and yeah, I just uh, moving forward, I think this is an important thing to keep an eye on. There's, there's no other way to say it. And I will be keeping an eye on it uh, in their next earnings update. All right, so now my second concern, which is delinquencies. Uh, so uh, we're going to start here with net charge offs or NCOs. Man, there's so many abbreviations in this deck. It's crazy. Um, how, so there was an increase, especially compared to a record low of Q2 there, which is just crazy low. Um, however, just to caveat this and why it's not too much of a cause for concern for me is the fact that their target for 2022 was at 0.15%, which they actually beat quite comfortably coming in at 0.11% there. So basically the earlier half of the year compensated for the latter half. Um, however, they, they've kind of, they're guiding for 0.25 to 0.45 over the cycle, uh, which they don't really define particularly well, to be honest, just like the cycle. Okay, so, you know, the macroeconomic situation. They do expect that as a combination of kind of their their customer base mixed with, you know, again, credit management, et cetera, that it's going to be on the lower end of this guidance, which I'd take to mean sort of under 0.3, maybe 3.3 three at the very highest, right, which is kind of almost turning them into the middle of the range. But I am expecting, therefore, to see an increase in this number over 2023. There's there's no doubt about it. I would highlight that the net charge offs compare very favorably compared to their peers. Uh, so they definitely have a bit more room to 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 manage that. Again, it was asked on the call, like what sets their net charge offs apart, right? Is it a similar kind of proprietary um, stuff that they have for the auto loans? And they did sort of say, you know, it's less, um, less clever in that, first of all, like 95% of their loans are secured. So from a customer perspective, right, you're much more likely to pay uh, secured loans for very obvious reasons, secured against sort of things like cars, boats, etc. As well as the fact that their customer base, uh, they deal with prime and super prime customers. So again, less likely to default on the whole. So it's just a business decision here where they're choosing to take less than they probably could, but they're expecting less um, debt, uh, bad debt by the end of it there. So for me, that was pretty good. Um, if we look at allowance for credit losses, so now we're on to more the business side. Um, I think it was okay, like it's stable basically, you, a super stable, um, which against the growing loan book is probably a good thing. It just means, you know, they're, they're keeping the actual um, relationship stable. What you don't want to see here, of course, is growing. And the only way you're funding that growth is to take on more risky customers. Obviously, ideally, you'd like to be taking on even better customers, in which case it would be going down as a percentage. Um, but still, there's some stability here, and I don't have a ton of um, concern within HBAN themselves. The one thing that I would flag is that they are this time now consistently running ahead of their peers. The peers are 1.44%, so again, significantly above. Um, it wasn't explained really why that was. My assumption here is kind of the, the regional nature where they operate with, is a region that has had some economic hardships um, from that perspective. We'll see how this does translate over time as they've kind of grown into less economically 
disadvantaged region, shall we say. Um, as long as this stays stable, I'm not overly concerned about it, but it will be something for us to keep an eye on, especially if business loans um, continue to grow faster than commercial loans. This could become more of an issue because obviously the, the weighting here is much higher on the ACL compared to the NCOs. All that said, though, I thought it was also really interesting, this criticized asset ratio. So this is basically the um, the concern. They haven't defaulted yet. They haven't written off anything, but there is a concern. So they're running behind on payments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I've been really impressed with I've actually been monitoring HBAM for closer to two years. And this has gone down over two years. Like you can just look at it at one year. Sure. But it's, it's going down. Uh, from north of 5% and it continues to go down. So for me, what I think if I if I sort of logically conclude this is that the customers who are criticized are can probably falling into two points, right? There you've got the very criticized, which is ultimately then what's going into these loan losses and, and write-offs. Um, and you've got the um, the kind of others that the less criticized that they're able to work with and bring out. So for me, I, I don't really know whether this is a, on balance, I think it's an okay thing, right? You're kind of limiting the pot of customers that are at risk of falling into the, the write-off. Um, and again, that that's, should be a good thing. It gives you more certainty and less downside. Um, but yeah, broadly speaking, it does mean that within that pot, there is a, a sub pot of really distressed customers who will ultimately turn into write-offs, etc. For me, though, I, I view their net charge offs uh, as especially impressive, even though there is, has been an increase in H2 um, and there is guidance for a further increase, uh, which would be quite significant, right? If it is basically they're giving a guidance that is going to double as a percentage. Um, so we'll see how that translates over time. Um, but yeah, that I, overall, I think this is a smaller concern for me just because of the fact the asset ratio that's in a critical position criticized um, is going down. The ACL is stable. Again, that could be better, but it could be worse. And the net charge offs, they beat their own target. So although I don't really like the direction of travel in H2 and moving forward, I think 2022 should be given a tick for the fact that they are managing this quite well. Um, and again, it would be very easy for things like lending criteria to slip as you grow, right? You take your eye off the ball a little bit in terms of your consumer base. You have new consumer base, right, as well, that you have to get to grips with. Um, we haven't really seen that translate into anything particularly worrying. Uh, so for me, I, I view this as a minor concern. Again, we're going to keep an eye on it just to make sure, but this has been a strong area for HBAN in the past. So I kind of want to make sure that we keep on top of it. And it would be lovely to see ACL decrease um, at least closer to other regional peers as well. So uh, that's all the details now, but let's wrap up with a conclusion. All right, so in terms of my conclusion, for me, Huntington Bank shares remains a very strong regional bank. I believe it's well managed and it is having an interesting situation with changing macroeconomic environment. Because they are so well rounded now, I think they do have an opportunity to manage that. So obviously the downside of that that growth has been as it's been funded by a dilution uh, by the increase in share count. However, you do get, again, a much more well rounded business for a regional bank. And there are significant and to me, fairly clear and obvious uh, synergistic opportunities. HBAN themselves highlight it. But that to me, though, is going to be very an important measure, therefore, against the non interest income. And we we're, we want to see that grow, basically, in order to justify some of the uh, especially sort of the private wealth and the, the middle market acquisitions that they've been making, certainly. For me, it offers an attractive dividend, even as a UK investor, 4.3% is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, so for me, that's pleasing. They also mentioned several times that they're sort of very on top of their cost control. That's part of the reason, according to them, why the acquisitions brought in earlier benefits than originally expected. I would also highlight that HBAN has become consistently good at beating EPS targets by mid to single figures. I think that's a fair call out and a consistency um, in that. Um, so the share price, uh, a quarter, <laughs> I don't know what happened with the close, by the way, my broker is for 14.11, Google has like 13.96, uh, so I'm sure, but we'll say 14 against uh, an earning per share of 150. I would argue it doesn't look expensive. Um, I would highlight that analyst targets here are quite wide. Uh, so 13 to $19 with an average of 16. Um, in terms of myself, uh, I have a target of 1720 here, so I guess I'm slightly more optimistic than the banks. The reason for that, I am more generally optimistic than most about the state of the global economy, including the US one and indeed including the region that HBAN operates in. I think they're a hardy bunch and I expect them to uh, grin and bear it and bounce back like this. This, this region has been through uh, economic difficulties before. And I'm not seeing it massively translating into the numbers with HVAN specifically as potentially a bellwether uh, of the states where it operates. In terms of my position, I've actually been in HVAN three times and sold out um, several, uh, you know, parts sold, et cetera, to take profits. So it's a bit mixed here. 
Uh, so my realized profit, 543, uh, total dividend, 147, 146. Uh, and my unrealized position here, I have 201 shares. Uh, so I'm up 6.5% uh, at the moment um, overall. So that's my current situation there. Uh, they are an important part of my financial uh, slice. They're my only bank, uh, pure bank. I do have a couple of insurers as well, as well as um, a Canadian ETF, which is very heavy on financials. Uh, but certainly HBAN is my main banking place specifically. Uh, I don't have any UK banks, etc. So uh, for me, this is a good long term holding. It fits kind of with my age, my risk profile and everything else. There are a couple of concerns. You you are always going to get some concerns about regional uh, with banks. Uh, there are also a couple of other fairly good uh, regional banks, I would say. Um, it's a bit mixed. You can actually buy an ETF in regional banks, uh, something I've been tempted to do always. But then I figure you might as well just buy a, a national bank at that stage. Um, so for me, I, I like HBAN. I think it does offer attractive, um, a number of attractive upsides compared to peers. Um, I think it's slightly undervalued at the moment, actually significantly undervalued. It, is, it was sort of running up and then sort of some of the big boys uh, published their results and, and that had an impact on the sector. But for me, I think there's um, significant upside from a share price perspective. You get the dividend, you should get the long term growth and uh, buyback potential as well. So, yeah, I, I'm positive on these results with a couple of sort of concerns. Uh, we'll keep an eye on them in three months time. That's everything I have to say about HBAN. I'm curious if people agree. Any other regionals that you'd highlight? Uh, what are your thoughts on HBAN? Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, everyone. I've been the Boss Hog, and good luck with your investing. Bye for now.